Cancer Council New South Wales acknowledges the traditional custodians, both past and present, of the lands on which we live and work. Hello and welcome. My name is Jill Mills and tonight we will be talking about the late effects of cancer treatment. So along with some information and strategies, we hope that you will also get to connect with others in the chat box, so please feel free to talk there. So before we get started, I'd like to take you through some housekeeping issues to make this event as seamless and interactive as possible. So during the webinar, if you would like to ask either the panel or myself a question, please use the chat facility located in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. And it looks like a lot of you have already um, seen it. And can you all hear me? Someone's asking, we can't hear. Um, so you can post comments, ask technical questions or share information between yourselves. So to protect your privacy, you will not be able to see who's logged in tonight, but in the chat area you'll see a first name and the initial of the surname, which you can all see now. And if you experience any difficulties hearing the sound throughout tonight's event, please feel free to listen via the telephone by dialing the 1800 number provided in the chat box and then enter the passcode provided, which I think um, the 1800 number's been there, but we might put it up again so you can see it. Um, we will also be launching some interactive polls um, throughout tonight's event. These are anonymous, so please feel free to participate. So during the last 15 minutes or so of the webinar, we will answer some of your questions addressing the most commonly raised themes. Um, we did have a lot of medical questions and um, unfortunately we're not really in a position to be answering those. Um, those questions really you need to talk to your specialist oncologist or GP or someone like that to get your individual advice. Um, so today's event will be recorded and everyone who registered will be sent a link to view a copy of the recording. So please don't worry if you get too distracted by the chat box, you can watch the presentation later. And if at any stage you need to speak to someone urgently, please do not hesitate to contact a Lifeline counsellor on 13 11 14 and the support is available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. So let's get started. Firstly I would like to introduce our panel. We've got Associate Professor Richard Conn. Karen Johnson and Michelle Joyce. And we have a special guest tonight, Kate Webber from the New South Wales Cancer Survivors Centre and she'll be helping us answer some of the questions at the end of the webinar. Because we have had a lot of questions regarding adults treated for cancer as well. So we want to make sure we cover all the bases and answer as many questions as possible. So the late effects of cancer treatment. The long term effects of cancer are many and varied and include physical effects such as impediments to neurocognitive development, organ damage, decreased growth and infertility, short or long term. These physical issues may also affect a survivor's ability to establish and maintain relationships, achieve academic and career success and to function in society. So the impact of the late effects of cancer treatment depends upon the location and extent of the primary disease, the type of development and its intensity, age at diagnosis and the level of physical and psychological development at the time of diagnosis and treatment. The invasive and sometimes radical treatments conducted prior to the 1980s have resulted in many people now in their 40s experiencing the late effects of their treatment, as Michelle will explain. So moving forward from those days, whilst people still experience late effects, the improvements in management and treatment methods has meant that late effects are not as common or enduring as they used to be. So Richard will discuss research and what it means to experience late effects. Karen will talk about survivorship care plans and why it is important to have one and also provide a case study. And Kate will answer some of the adult focus late effects questions as I mentioned. So now we have our first polling question. So as I said it's anonymous, please feel free to um, answer it. So the question is do you worry about the late effects of cancer treatment? So yes, no, sometimes not something that occupies your mind all the time. So feel free to respond. So I'm not sure how many people we've got logged on so far. About 60 or so? Yeah. We had about, about 360 registrations for tonight, so we've had a great response. So that looks great. Thank you everyone for participating in the poll. So now I'd like to introduce again Michelle Joyce. Welcome Michelle, we'll move on to your first slide. Here we go. So over to you Michelle. Hi everyone, I'm Michelle, this is my story. 
my um, diagnosis, I was in it was 1972. My, I was four years old, a month um, of age, and my mum, she had a mother's instinct that something was wrong, gut instinct, and it was. She took me to the doctor, and they pretty much said that there was nothing wrong. She went back home and just went back to normal life. And in August of 1972, I came into the bedroom and said to mum, I lifted my nightie and had this lump on my abdomen. Showed her, and she was horrified. I had this large lump on my abdomen, and it was there that she had to quickly get some help for me. She didn't know exactly what to do. She called her father, and he was able to. Um, get in touch with some doctors and before mum knew it I was at uh, Prince of Wales Hospital at Randwick and within two or three days I was in surgery having a very large tumour removed from my abdomen which was uh, called a Wilms tumour, it was on my kidney and it was the size of a small pumpkin. So mum had then, she was told that it was a cancer, it was a stage two Wilms tumour which in today's terms would be a stage three, and we had to move, like, get straight onto treatment. I was given, um, obviously, the surgery, and I had radiotherapy for six weeks every day for four days a week, and then I had chemotherapy for a period of almost two years. Uh, they used two drugs at that time, vincristine and actinomycin D, and we just um, treatment was really harsh back then, and mum just had to deal with it. You can see the photos I've got here. I chose these photos. Firstly, the, the first one there is um, me. I just started treatment, I think probably about a couple of months into it, and it was my sister's Holy Communion. And mum just, um, the best thing to, to do was just continue life as normal. The next photo you can see is me with my sisters. I'd actually lost all my hair by then, and a very clever, um, Person. It was a black and white photo and they actually painted my hair in. So I've been given a bit of a curly hairdo there, which was quite funny. And um, moving on into treatment, I was diagnosed before starting school. After Christmas I had to start school. I was probably in about, I was probably into about three, four months of treatment. And I started school in 1973. This photo was taken in winter, I can see the uniform, so I would have been probably about nine months into treatment. Starting school was really difficult. Um, I did start relatively bald, so I was given a wig and um, that was really awkward. Kids used to pull the wig off and I just have some not particularly good memories of those things. And there was a lot of um, sickness from the chemotherapy, I had a lot of vomiting and things like, things like that. Um, Another, I just wanted to say that moving on in cancer treatment is really important. Mum was determined that I would lead a normal life. She had been raising the three girls up as a single mother and she was lucky enough to find love again and um, was married to my stepfather, John, and we became a family unit. And you can see there I look really healthy and I was, I'd just finished treatment or just finishing treatment, I think. So we were able to move on there. Um, my treatment ended in 1974. That's when I had to go into follow-up and I had to go every three months for five years and then into what's now called the long-term follow-up clinic. Uh, as I developed, mum was taking me back for follow-up and it was probably in my late um, primary school, early high school that that they noticed that there was some physical side effects of the treatment that they'd given me. I suffered scoliosis and kyphoscoliosis, right side muscle wasting and underdevelopment and rotated right hip and pelvis and some asymmetry of my body. Uh, so those things, they're the physical side effects. And then as I got older, I, at the age of seven, I got a um, benign tumour on my wrist and then at the age of 14, I got a benign tumour in my breast and then since then I've had serious, various cysts and lipomas. Uh, unsure whether they're late effects, but they're certainly unique to me and not to my sisters. Um, another side effect of the treatment I had is a very large scar on my abdomen. I actually measured it the other day. It's about 13 inches long, so it's pretty, pretty big and obviously developed, got larger as I got larger. And um, some of the other side effects that 
uh, I would like to mention a psychological and emotional. Uh, things, there was no counselling when I went through treatment. It was um, just you got on with treatment, you went back to your life. Probably the most of the psychological things came out in my teenage years and were mostly related around my um, physical side effects. And then as I, as I grew older into my teens, uh, late teens, uh, it was brought to my attention that the possibility of fertility may be a problem and I was asked if I would like to go and see a fertility expert. So I went to a fertility expert in my late teens and um, it, it appeared that everything was going okay and they said that they weren't quite sure whether I'd be able to have children or not. That's from the um, extensive radiation I had to my abdomen, uh, which they weren't sure what the effects of that were going to be. It was still um, in the early days of finding these things out. So I've just skipped forward there. Later on in my teens, I met my um, husband, John, and we were married in 1988. John's been a fantastic support to me um, in the psychological and emotional side of my side effects. Uh, he's been a great husband and really supportive of everything that I've had to go through. 18 months into our marriage, uh, I was diagnosed with a second cancer. It was microinvasive cancer of the cervix. This was uh, discovered just through a routine pap smear and uh, it was actually the end of, I'd, I'd take, had some risky behaviour in my teens, I'd started smoking and um, in the 80s that was not uncommon and we weren't told not to smoke, unlike the teenagers today and I certainly wasn't told as a cancer survivor that smoking was extremely detrimental to my health. So upon the diagnosis of the cancer of the cervix, my um, specialist said to me that you'll never touch a cigarette again, will you? And I said, definitely not. So I've actually never had a cigarette again, so that was probably a really, really good thing. In, uh, after, oh, after the cancer of the cervix, that was treated um, with surgery because it was caught so early, I was lucky. And the specialist I was seeing at the time, Dr. Beale, he said to me that because of my history, if I wanted to have children, it was probably um, in my interest to try, to try now. So we got through about six months of uh, checkups and lucky for me, you can see I actually feel pregnant, so I'm having my first child there. Sean was born naturally in 1991 and it was an extremely difficult birth. I, um, my pelvis and that from the radiation had um, caused some problems. My second pregnancy was um, probably a little bit difficult than the first and that was because um, I was looking after another child as well. And then in 1997, after some other um, gynecological problems, it was decided uh, I'd have a hysterectomy. So that was performed and it was discovered that once again, because of the radiation, it was actually a really difficult surgery from all the adhesions and everything that had um, been caused by the radiation. In 2009, I had some bowel issues and was um, referred to a specialist to have a colonoscopy. This unfortunately for me ended in a perforated bowel. It was um, caused by a simple biopsy of the irradiated part of the bowel and for me it was probably the turning point at how I approached my own health care. Prior to going into the colonoscopy, I had had some fears that that may happen. I um, had some information that there was a possibility that my bowel had, was compromised because of the radiation. So it was at that point I decided that I needed to become more in control of my own health care. One of the other side effects I suffer is lymphedema. It's only mild. It's in my right leg and on the same side of the body that I've been irradiated and had all my, most of my surgery. To manage my side effects, um, pretty much most of my side effects are physical. So I've concentrated on the um, having an active lifestyle, uh, things like maintaining a healthy diet and my weight. And I've had physiotherapy, osteop osteopathy, remedial massage, and I've um, I swim when I can. I did uh, swimming for about four or five years from, to help my back. The most 
um, encouraging thing for me has been in the last nine months. So I've been referred to an exercise physiologist and I'm actually really surprised at the, the improvement in my body and the muscle development on the right side of my body and the, uh, the help that it's given me in the strength of my back. I actually haven't had too many back problems in the last couple of months, like four or six months and that's definitely due to the exercise physiology that I've, I've been attending. Psychologically and my, um, and my emotional well-being, pretty much, like I said, I didn't get any counselling over the years, but I pretty much lead a normal life. In 2012 though, that was my 40 years um, anniversary of survival and my family and I decided that we would have a celebration which was um, centred around my 40 years survival. But we've had a bit of fun with it because not only was I um, celebrating 40 years, but my sister Kathy, who you saw in the first slide, when I was operated on, it was actually on her seventh birthday. So just as a little bit of a treat, I thought I'd surprise her with seventh birthday cake 40 years later, the cake that she missed out on while I was in surgery and stole our mother and all the attention. So that was, she was, I think she was quite chuffed that she got this cake. And you can see the flowers there to the right. They were a um, display that my family decided to send to me just to acknowledge that we'd reached 40 years and we hadn't celebrated it any, any of it before. And my sister actually said, oh, they're so nice. They'll last for ages, a bit like you, because there's some, <laughs> there's some natives in there. So she just um, thought I'd probably get a lot of, lot of time out of those flowers. Uh, another thing that I do to um, probably help with my emotional well-being is fundraising. I've been um, participating in fundraising events to raise money for cancer probably since about 2000. Um, one, you can see the two slides here. One of them I do every year and have done for the last 11 years is Daffodil Day. It's, um, I, I just get so much um, sense of, I, I just really like doing it and a sense of giving back to um, the places that have been able to help me over the years. And the other photo there is with a, another survivor, a friend. She um, and I were doing Relay for Life there. So that's, that's always a really, I don't know, you just get a sense, you walk around the track and you're wearing your survivor sash and it's just telling everyone that you don't have to die from cancer and that you can be a survivor and live a really a great life. Today, that's a photo of my family, uh, my two children grown up. My, it was at my daughter's 21st and I chose that photo because to me it just showed that I'm leading a healthy and happy and a normal life but also that we'd, we'd sort of made it. Both kids were 21 and both adults and you know we'd, we'd come a long way. Uh, the future for me and the message I would like to get a lot over to you today is Things like looking after yourself and for me it's exercise physiology, uh, for you it may be something different. I think each person and each um, cancer survivor has to find the thing that suits them. It's a very personal journey and there are no two stories the same and the side effects for um, all survivors will be different in every case and I just think you need to take note of your side effects and then try and find the things that suit you. Uh, the other really important thing that I discovered and uh, part of that was from when I talked about my bowel just before is finding the right health professional for you. You need to go into that um, doctor's room and feel comfortable and be able to discuss things and make some decisions for yourself that sometimes uh, may not, the doctors may not agree with and that is advocating for your own health. Uh, the other thing I do is I uh, make sure that I have my regular checkups. I've um, pretty much got a, um, a little schedule of all the things I'm supposed to do and I keep a record of my tests and my scans and I keep those records for myself so that I'm keeping on top of it. I also go to long-term follow-up clinics and seminars. These have been extremely beneficial. They, um, the ones I go to are held by Sydney Children's Hospital and by the long-term long -term follow-up clinic. There um, have been a huge, um, they've given me a huge amount of information. 
and the other thing I've done is uh, participate in research studies. These studies have been more to give um, probably back to, it, they don't actually provide me with any information. In one particular research study, myself and my sisters and my children, we all gave our DNA samples so that they could um, do studies on those and see if there's any links in uh, familial cancer, I think it's called. And um, But I see that as a positive thing because if anything can help future survivors and future treatment, that's a positive thing. The other um, source I use is the internet, obviously reputable sources only, uh, but I've found it really, really um, helpful because when I was diagnosed, there was nothing. There was no support groups, there was no um, internet, there was no information. It was just pretty much go to the hospital, have your treatment and go home and then as the years go by, find out what happens to you as you go along. So the internet for me has been a really good source of information. The um, last thing I'd like to say is, and it's something that I do every day, I enjoy I actually went to the zoo a couple of weeks ago and ticked off one of my bucket list items. I fed a giraffe, which um, you can see the photo there, and that's just something that makes me really happy. And I think um, that's really important to have a successful and happy life is just to do things that you like. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. That was fantastic, and thank you so much for sharing. Um, so another polling question, please all participate. So does Michelle's story inspire you to advocate for your own health care? Please feel free to contribute. Fantastic. That's great. Thank you, everybody. So we'll move on now. So we now are going to move on to Associate Professor Richard Conn from the Kids Cancer Centre at Sydney Children's Hospital. Welcome, Richard. I have just said thank you to Michelle for sharing her story with us and highlighting so many important points uh, for people who are listening to us this evening. Michelle, of course, was diagnosed in the early 70s at a time, as you'll see on the graph, that there were very few survivors. Since that time, we've come to a point where very excitingly, almost two thirds of adults and about 80% of children can expect to live five years or more and the majority of them to be cured of their cancer. So that survivorship has become an integral part of the practice of uh, oncology today. We're not aiming, as was the case in Michelle's era, to cure at all costs, but are trying to improve the quality of survival. So we're aiming to have survivors who are free of handicaps caused either by their disease, by the cancer or its treatment, who are able to keep up and compete with their peers, who are employable, insurable, and able to take their rightful place in society. And that we're doing through research and benefiting from what we've learned from people like Michelle who've participated in studies and who've continued to come back so that we can help her but can also learn and do things that are helpful to the generation of patients who are being treated today. In the 80s, the term survivor began to be used by advocacy groups in preference to cancer victim or cancer patient and to find individuals who were de disease free for a minimum of five years. We now realize that many of the late effects can start before five years, but we also know, and this is an important message, that for many patients, the late effects may only come on many years, and in the case of children, um, up to 30, 40 years after their treatment. Hence, follow-up needs to be truly long-term. In recent years, um, 
there's been a lot of research, as I mentioned. Um, in 2005, this publication recognized the dearth of follow-up for adult survivors, and um, this is now being remedied and corrected. In pediatrics, long-term survivorship clinics have been held for many years. As a general rule, in the first couple of years, the focus is on the diagnosis and treatment. Uh, there's monitoring for cancer recurrence, and there's management of the acute side effects such as mouth ulcers, nausea, vomiting, and infection. In the period after the completion of therapy, we see the patients regularly and we monitor, monitor for recurrence of the cancer. We're also using this time to educate and um, counsel patients. So we're trying to ensure that our survivors from an early age are having healthy lifestyles, avoiding smoking, avoiding excessive alcohol, ensuring that they keep a trim body weight because there is evidence that some of the side effects that are experienced by survivors can be modified and moderated by avoiding obesity. This includes the development of second cancers and um, some of the cardiac, the heart complications that I'll refer to. Beyond five years, the risk of relapse or recurrence is small and we see the patients at a less frequent interval but still see them regularly so that we can do surveillance for the late effects which may occur many years after treatment. It's important that there's early diagnosis which allows early intervention and can prevent some of the severity of the late effects. I think many of the people who attend long-term follow-up in the earlier years of their survival wonder why they're coming because they may not have side effects but it is an opportunity for us to educate them to make sure that they're knowledgeable about their disease and to give age appropriate information because in the terms of uh, children who are survivors um, it would be inappropriate to discuss fertility um, university education when they're young, but becomes very important as they grow older. Now, we've been talking about late effects. The late effect is generally defined as a problem related to the cancer or its treatment and persisting from the time of treatment or developing five or more years from diagnosis. It's always daunting to hear about late effects, and we recognize that. But to make a couple of points, late effects are possible only when cancer therapy is successful. And serious late effects are relatively uncommon. Michelle mentioned that she experienced a number of side effects that our knowledge today could have avoided, and that is true. On the slide on your left, is a picture of Michelle. She mentioned that she had curvature of the spine. Now, in the time that she was treated, radiation was given to the area where the kidney tumor lay, and they tried to avoid irradiating the spine, but didn't realize that the way they were doing it caused, caused scatter to the uh, spinal bones, to the vertebrae, and they grew differently so that they cause severe curvature of the spine. The young girl on the right of Michelle has been treated in the modern era. Um, we now cross the midline with the radiation and we have smaller vertebrae, sometimes not noticeable by the patient, but a normal functioning spine. Now, there are a number of late effects which are described. Um, in terms of children, it can affect their linear growth and uh, their maturation. In adults and in children, there are a number of body organs which can be affected. 
The organs which are affected are specific to the type of treatment that the patient receives. So you won't get heart problems, cardiac problems, unless you have treatment that damages the heart or um, if you have radiation to the chest. Um, radiation and some of the drugs can affect the lungs, can affect the kidneys. Uh, hormonal problems are fairly common, especially following radiation. When we look at the bones of a 30-year-old survivor, we often see bones that look like a 60-year-old with osteoporosis. And it's important that this is picked up because there are ways that we can improve the um, quality of the bone. Michelle mentioned her concerns about fertility. This is a big concern for many patients who are treated at a younger age. Today, if the patient is post-pubital, we are often able to store sperm or to store um, over in the older patient with a partner. We can even store embryos. So there are many ways that fertility can be spared. And what we've learned from survivors over the years has made us change much of the treatment that we use so that today we are able to treat without causing fertility problems in many patients. The health of offspring is always a concern, and it's reassuring that all the studies have shown that if the father or the mother has been treated but has remained fertile, that the offspring will be normal with no increased risk of congenital anomalies. There is the risk if the cancer is hereditary that that can be passed on, but that's in a small number of patients. Second cancers are another big concern for uh, patients having treatment, and most of the drugs that we use do carry a small risk, but one that we have to warn patients about. Increasingly, though, we are using less radiation because of its risk of second cancers, and we are avoiding drugs which can cause uh, second cancers. Part of our strategy in the long-term follow-up clinic is to predict from the knowledge that we have who might be at risk and where those second cancers might arise, and therefore advise surveillance that would allow early pickup in the small percentage of patients who are going to develop them. Very technical. Now, not all late effects are life-threatening. Uh, many are life-altering. Um, we've touched on infertility, uh, cognitive problems, hearing may be a problem depending on the treatment that you receive. Um, the life-threatening complications, though, may be made less if there's a tension to um, avoiding obesity um, and ensuring that endocrine problems are managed. So again, the importance of attending for long-term follow-up so that these interventions can be performed. Michelle mentioned that psychosocial late effects weren't touched on in her era. Most patients today, not all, would have counseling during treatment, but there are a number that can be life-altering in the survivorship period. Um, there may be patients who aren't able to achieve what they would normally have academically. Some have problems with employment. Um, there may be social isolation. And um, these are all things that in the long-term follow-up we try to address and assist the patients. A previous webinar dealt with depression and fear of recurrence. We're also very aware that some patients experience problems with getting insurance and are discriminated against in applying for jobs. And the Cancer Council and our, our long-term follow-up clinic try to uh, ensure that there is no discrimination um, and to advocate on behalf of the survivors. Now, I mentioned earlier that not everybody will experience all, and the majority, hopefully, will experience very few late effects. Because of our research and because of people like Michelle who have kept coming back, we have learned what drugs and what radiation produce 
side effects, and we can actually predict, based on the treatment that the individual patient has received, what their risk of late effects is, uh, and then personalize the care that they receive in the long-term period. So, for example, a young girl who's received radiation, which involves the chest and therefore the breast, we would be recommending that from the age of 25 or eight years after radiation, she should have imaging of the breast. So that's 15 years earlier than the general population because of the increased risk of um, breast cancer in this at-risk group. And if that is followed, we are often able to detect it early with a very good outcome. Now, the way that we provide long-term follow-up is not the same for everybody. Those patients who are at greatest risk uh, because of the intensity of their treatment would attend a multidisciplinary cancer-specific long-term follow-up clinic. But for many patients who we've learned from our research over the years are at lower risk of late effects, um, they're able to attend lower risk clinics, to attend nurse-led clinics, and now we believe we're in a position where we can comfortably, with good communication, refer patients back to primary care. And I'd like to just add that we do believe that primary care, having a GP, is vital for every cancer patient and every survivor. Many people during treatment lose contact with their general practitioner and it's very important because of the holistic care that they can provide that people return to their primary care physician even if they are still being seen in the long-term follow-up clinic. So I've highlighted that many late effects are modifiable, that there are strategies that we can advise to prevent or decrease the severity. We do advise on imaging and other tests so that we can detect uh, the late effect early and intervene. We encourage everyone, as Michelle uh, highlighted, to make healthy choices, healthy lifestyle choices, avoiding smoking. Everybody's at risk of cancer who smokes, people who've been treated for the cancer already are at greater risk. Exercise, avoid excessive sun exposure. And the point that Michelle made was keep contact with your medical carers. What has been shown in many studies right around the world is that as the risk of late effects increases over time, and for many childhood cancer survivors, this can be 15, 20 years later, the number of people attending long-term follow-up, as shown with the white line, decreases so that they don't benefit from the advice, the surveillance, and the early intervention that we could offer. If you're going to get the most out of your follow-up care, it's important to remember that the most important member of your healthcare team is you. Michelle mentioned how important it is for you to advocate for your care. I'm saying it's important for you to ensure that you are in the care of your GP or in the care uh, of specialists who are knowledgeable about survivorship. And it's important if you're going to get the most out of this care, that you are knowledgeable. Many people in the study that I've put up there did not know their diagnosis, and only half of the patients knew that they'd received Dorna Rubison or Adriamycin in the study. Why that is important is that those are two drugs which affect the heart, and if you present with symptoms, it's very important for the doctor to whom you're presenting to know that you've been exposed to those drugs because he will consider other differentials um, that he wouldn't necessarily consider in a normal or a non-treated individual. Now, to ensure that you know that information, most treatment centers today will provide you with a cheat sheet 
with a health summary, a health passport, um, a survivorship care plan. And I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Karen, who's going to speak about the provision of health care plan. Thanks very much. Thanks, Richard. And that was a, a great presentation. Um, so we have a quick polling question before Karen starts. So do you feel you have a better understanding now about the late effects and how you might be able to manage your health, maybe in a different way than what you've been doing currently? So again, please feel free to participate, totally anonymous. Um, it gives us a good, good idea of um, how we're going here. Great, thank you very much. So we'll move on now as Richard introduced to Karen, who also works at the Kids Cancer Centre. So over to you, Karen. Hi, everyone. So this is a little bit more of a sort of practical and things that you can actually uh, do yourself. So why should we have a survivorship care plan? It's really well documented now. It's, it's not a surprise. Many institutions around the world are uh, recommending that everyone have a health summary, a care plan. Some people call them passports, whatever they are. It's basically just a snapshot of what your treatment was, uh, what your cancer was, and where you were treated. So just to give you an example, this one, for people who don't have one, you can actually download this from the Children's Oncology Group website, the Survivorship Guidelines. You can fill it in yourself, or you can take it to your healthcare professional and have them help you fill it in. And it's really a useful tool, particularly if you do move places start up with a new healthcare uh, practitioner. Um, so you can fill it in by hand. You don't have to have it anything fancy. We do provide them for the children, but sorry. Um, and this is just an example of the one that we use. Oh, it's not moving on. Um, is that, I hope that's projecting well, but anyway, regardless, if you go to the Children's Oncology Group website and look for the survivorship guidelines, it is actually called a summary of cancer treatment. There's an abbreviated one and there's a long term, uh, much longer sort of one for things like if you've had stem cell transplant or more than one uh, issue with cancer. Is that right? There we go. This is just a snapshot of the ones that the children get provided when they come to our um, clinic in Sydney. And uh, I'm just seeing on the web chat, does this apply to adult cancer diagnosis? Um, yes, it does. Anybody can fill it in. It's not specific to children. Um, and it really is important that you keep a record of it and show it to any healthcare professional. As in this slide, when do I use it? Any time, particularly in an emergency situation or when you need assistance explaining your previous medical history. Now that's not to say that you need to show this document to an employer or someone that you're trying to get insurance or a mortgage from. That's none of their business. But it's certainly important if you're seeing any healthcare professionals. I'm just going to highlight why you really do need to know. And, and this is an important thing. It's probably a lot more um, relevant to people who've survived childhood cancer. Because as you can imagine, many of the kids like Michelle or are even younger when they're diagnosed. So Evie's someone I've known for a very long time um, because I have worked at the hospital for a really long time. She's now 23 years of age. She's a second, second generation Chinese Australian and she's a very bright girl. She attended a selective high school and she's the first person in her family to attend university and she's currently studying economics. And her family are incredibly proud of her. Um, Evie's medical history, she was 18 months of age when she was diagnosed with stage 3 kidney um, tumour, a Wilms tumour, and she also had a single metastasis in the lung. So she received three lots of chemotherapy drugs and she also had an nephrectomy, which means removing, your one, removing a kidney, so she's only got one kidney, and she had radiation to the left side of her abdomen and her left lung. Evie's parents chose not to tell her she had cancer as a toddler, but they did attend clinic very regularly. Evie's mum would always ask us not to mention the cancer, even though she was coming to an oncology clinic. At 16 years of age, Evie came to clinic. She was now in long-term follow-up, and her mother again requested that we not tell her about her previous diagnosis. 
and we discussed this with her mother. We tried to advise her of the really important reasons that we should explain this to Evie and as from what you've heard from Michelle's presentation, it is pretty important that you know all of these things. Evie's mum was told that at the next visit Evie would be an adult and we would need to tell her her own health benefits. They missed their next two appointments. Four years later, Evie presented to the emergency department. She had some fluttery feelings in her chest and felt breathless. Her previous medical history wasn't disclosed to the triage staff. She was triaged as a non-emergency because of her age and told to wait in the waiting area. After three hours, they left without being seen. The next day, I received a message on my voicemail, which is only attended Monday to Friday. Could I please call Evie urgently? She was having, Evie's mother, she was having big problems with her heart and breathing. So obviously we sent Evie to the emergency room. This time her mother was more forthcoming with the information but not in front of Evie. She was referred to have further heart and lung investigations and we asked her to come back to clinic. We gave her a full education about her previous illness and the potential health issues as a result of her treatment and she was given a health summary. She wasn't happy about her parents' decision to keep such important information from her but she did understand that they were trying to protect her although it was probably misguided. This is just a snapshot of we gave we gave um, Evie, and this is really just to say that you know if she had have produced this at the emergency room, then she probably would have been taken a little more seriously and would have been triaged at a higher level. Really important information to know the total dose of your anthracycline because of the risk to the heart, as um, Richard's already gone through, and also the radiation dose and the area that was given to. And this is also just the follow-up that we would recommend for someone based on the treatment that they received. So in conclusion, Evie's really well, although she does have some mild cardiac compromise and that's now being carefully managed. But the lessons learned, know your medical history and have a brief written summary of your treatment. So you may be attending the best long-term follow-up in the clinic of the world, but it will mean nothing if you don't advocate for yourself and share the image information you have been provided. And we don't want to promote over-vigilance or hyper-awareness or anxiety, but if something feels different to your usual self, have it checked out. If you're seeing a GP you haven't met before, give them your history. If you have a good regular GP, stick with them. And if you don't find one, ask friends and relatives. Once you have a relationship with them, they will also know what is usual for you and be able to care for you in a much better way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. Um, so I think the overarching message here is about the survivorship care plan. Um, so again, polling question and just asking the people that are logged on tonight, do you actually have a survivorship plan? Um, and it, there's been a lot of comments about the difference between childhood cancer and adult cancers. Um, so a lot of the overarching message, regardless if it's you've had cancer as a child or as an adult is to have one of these plans because it's something useful you can carry with you um, and, and also to have those regular checkups which we'll talk about in the summary. But thank you very much for answering the um, polling question there. So now we're going to move on to the question um, part of tonight. So um, just introduce Karen Webber. So we'll just stay on that slide for a minute because that's where I've got my notes. So. Um, Sorry, not Karen Weber, Kate Weber. <laughs> Start again. So Kate is a medical oncologist and has a clinical, she's from the New South Wales Cancer Survivors Centre. She is a medical oncologist and has a clinical interest and research interest in the physical, psychological and practical area of cancer and its treatment. So she deals a lot more with adults, which is what everyone's been asking for. Um, she conducts clinical consultations with cancer survivors and is responsible for coordinating and leading many research projects. So some projects she has been involved in were, uh, include the fatigue after treatment, which we had a lot of questions about fatigue uh, for early breast cancer, the impact on healthcare utilisation and unmet needs, and also the impact of treatment on sexual function and quality of life. Now we have Kate, she's a special guest tonight. Um, and Kate, if you can say hello, we can't see her, but you will hear her. Uh, hi everyone. Hi Kate, thank you. So. We'll start off with the questions. Um, the first one is, was asked um, for Michelle to answer. So when would you have liked to have been informed about the potential effects of cancer? So if everyone can make sure that they're, um, they now are unmuted so they can speak. So Michelle, if you'd like to um, answer that question. 
Yeah, hi. Um, the thing is with me, because I was treated so long ago, as Richard was saying, uh, a lot of the long-term side effects, they weren't known. So um, as I developed and each one that came up, they, they did tell me as they came up. So they, that's how we found them out. But I think mostly um, side effects, it's probably too much a diagnosis sometimes because you've got to go through the treatment and there's just a lot to take in. But uh, I think if they know them, they can tell them to you. But um, I think for me, the, the, when I would have liked to have been told, well, I, I feel like I was told everything that I could have been told as I went through treatment and then uh, right through to, um, to now. So I'm not sure what else I could say to that question other than um, it should be age appropriate. Then if you're a child or if you're an adult, obviously um, the, they know a lot of the side effects. So if you're given particular drugs, well, I'm sure um, when you're having treatment, they're probably telling you the side effects um, at that time anyway. So I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Michelle. So, so Kate, are you happy we'll go through the questions on the slide? Yeah, sure, that's fine. Okay, so I'll read them out. So um, are there side effects that affect people with all kinds of cancer or that are they specific to certain types? Which Richard did talk a little about, so if you, would you like to make a comment on that, Kate? And I guess from the adult perspective, maybe, as well? Um, look, I guess from an adult perspective, we have really learned a lot from our paediatric colleagues. Um, traditionally, as many of you might have um, known, that in adult oncology, there's been this magical five-year mark after which people get discharged from follow-up. And in many ways, we really don't know what happened to our patients thereafter. Um, and we've learned from our paediatric colleagues who have been following people like Michelle for 20 years or more um, what can happen past that, that magical time point. Um, I guess the other really key thing that we've learned here is that um, whilst there are some features of, of, this, of um, what happens after cancer that are specific to the kind of cancer you've had, many of the other things are um, more directly related to the kind of treatment you had. So whether you had radiotherapy for a lymphoma or for a sarcoma or for a breast cancer, the side effects related to radiation will be common depending on what part of your body it was treated. Similarly, if you got a drug like doxorubicin for a childhood cancer or you got it for breast cancer, the, the potential impact on your heart is similar. So it's not just about what kind of cancer you had, but also the kind of treatment that you had that's important. Yeah, and I think that's something that's come up again and again in all the questions. I think we got like 120 questions or something, or 103 questions, so a lot of questions. Um, and we've tried to theme them, so we'll move on to the next one. Um, can you offer any hints or advice on coping with the long-term side effects of radiation treatment and also the psychological effects of the ongoing and seemingly endless side effects? So, oh, Kate? <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, I think um, everybody's experience is different. I think that's the first thing to note. For many people, um, things will improve in the early period after their cancer treatment. So some people, some of their symptoms will get better, but others will persist, and particularly things like fatigue, like chemo brain, which I, I see coming up again and again in the list down there. Um, will, differ from person to person and also differ um, in relation to what it is that um, you need to be able to do. Um, you might find that certain tasks that used to be routine suddenly take longer or are more challenging after cancer. Um, but if an, another patient had the same treatment and doesn't need to do those tasks, it won't be so, so important to them. I think, again, this is another reason why um, Knowing what's normal for you, being um, a driver of your own follow-up care is important so that you can go to your doctors and, and tell them when something is really still a problem. Now some of these um, late side effects, things like chemo brain and post-cancer fatigue are, are not things we can cure overnight. Um, they're things that we can help people learn to manage and potentially do improve with time. Um, but there isn't an, an easy cure. And so uh, learning 
to what services are out there that can help you with these kind of things. Uh, as Michelle mentioned, exercise physiologists, in some cases um, uh, psychology or a combination of psychology and exercise physiology to deal with both the physical and the mental aspects of those sort of side effects are really important. Um, I guess um, it, it's such a huge question to try and deal with all the side effects of treatment. Um, basically, um, side effects can affect any tissue, any um, aspect of your psyche, um, your practical and physical function, um, and really the key is individualising um, your needs and your follow-up and having a survivorship plan is um, central to all of that. Um, okay, and I guess the last one there, because we, we're getting close to time, um, about the homeopathic medicine. Do you have an opinion on that or whether someone else would like to address that question? Okay, I'll, I'll start with that as well. Um, look, I guess the official position really is, um, you know, in Australia at least, is the NHMRC has recently published a very big review that found that there was no evidence of sort of homeopathy um, improving um, any medical condition. I guess more generally though, um, I know that a lot of patients turn to things like homeopathy and other alternative therapies and I understand why people do that. Um, I, it, a cancer diagnosis is obviously very threatening and um, it's helpful when you can try and can, you know do whatever you can to help yourself I guess. Um, my perspective on it is that if you're doing something that is helping you feel better, is not breaking the bank, is um, that you're being open and transparent with what you're doing with your treating clinicians and you're taking on board their judgment um, as to whether or not it will interfere with the treatment that you're having um, or, or the follow-up care you're having, then um, I, I personally am okay about that and I just would rather have an open conversation with patients about what it is they're doing um, than have them feel as though they can't talk about it. Good advice. Now Kate, there were a couple of questions I sent in a message to you and it was about that, the good old five year survivorship definition. So um, Chris C asked the question, does the Australian definition therefore exclude people like me? who do not really have a post-treatment phase but are actively being treated. So how do we deal with that? Yeah, look, the, the term survivorship and when do you become a survivor has always been very contentious. Um, back, as, as Richard alluded to, back in the 1980s this, this um, term of being a survivor at five years came up because it really wasn't recognised that side effects of treatment could go on um, long term and needed attention. And so initially really it was about developing advocacy for the people who had survived long term. These days though we know that the problems don't magically start at five years. Some of them start while you're still on treatment. Some of them may not arise till 10, 20 or 30 years after your treatment. So really um, a, a more broad definition of survivorship meaning you know, you're a survivor from the moment that you're diagnosed to the day that you die, regardless of whether it's of cancer or something else, um, is a definition that's been accepted by other by many groups. I guess in practical terms, though, when we're thinking about developing services for cancer survivors, we really want to make that about people who are living well with or after cancer, as opposed to supporting people on treatment or um, supporting people who are going through the end stages of their illness and needing palliative care. So really in Australia what we're talking about when we talk about survivorship is um, supporting people living well after cancer. Thank you. Um, so you've got a couple of questions that you were going to read out and talk about I think Kate. Oh, okay. Oh, somebody else raised a question during the discussion about alcohol intake I think. Through, yeah. um, I guess um, increasingly we, we are learning that alcohol is bad for you um, just as, as we learned that smoking was many years ago and, and some cancers are alcohol um, related. Um, that said, the Australian population guidelines are that um, 
people should have uh, no more than two drinks on one day and certainly no more drinks, no more than four drinks in one sitting. And there's no reason to think that we should recommend anything different to people who've had cancer. If you'd like to have a glass of wine now and then, go for it. It's, you know, there's no reason why you shouldn't if that's what you enjoy. Um, but in everything in moderation and certainly um, in looking to optimise your health gut long term, it, it's just about being sensible about doing exercise, not smoking, moderating alcohol intake, maintaining a healthy body weight and all those, um, you know, very boring but very um, important messages that you'll hear over and over again. We keep hearing them for all sorts of health conditions, don't we? That's right. And I think people are sometimes a bit disappointed to hear that the, the diet that is good for cancer is the same diet that's good for cardiovascular disease and diabetes and maintaining a healthy weight. It's, you know, lots of fresh fruit and vegetables, um, limiting um, fats and, and refined sugars, just a very sensible and broad diet. Agreed. Agree, yeah. Totally agreed. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. And I think in the regards of time, we might move on. Sorry we haven't been able to get to everybody's questions, but I think some of the specific medical questions are really questions you need to speak to your treating specialist or, or doctor on. Um, so we're going to move to the next slide. So in summary, get a survivorship care plan. Talk to your doctors. Ask them. Tell them you want one. Um, advocate for your own health, as Michelle and the others have been saying, get regular checkups, tests and scans, keep your own records, attend follow-up clinics, participate in research and as we just said, exercise and a healthy diet. So um, Richard's going to quickly, in a minute, talk about a study that you can participate in. Um, so go for it, Richard. Thanks, Joel. Just to mention that uh, we've been doing a study on adult survivors of childhood cancer um, and looking at what follow-up they're getting and what the barriers are to attending follow-up clinics. Um, what was interesting that 44% of the um, number of patients who have res responded so far um, do not attend a long-term follow-up clinic, but um, over half of them said they were dissatisfied with their follow-up care. Now, the information we're getting from these questionnaires will help us to make the clinics more user-friendly, possibly to overcome um, some of the tyranny of distance and um, involve general practitioners in rural and remote areas. So if there are any long-term survivors who would like to participate, um, you can go on to the website uh, www.isurvived.org.au or onto the website behavioralsciencesunit.org, long-term follow-up. Um, and it's very valuable because, as we've said tonight, we continually are learning from survivors and we're able to better help the survivors but we're also able to modify our treatments so that hopefully the next generation of patients being treated will have a better quality of life, not only a better survival. Thanks, Jill. Thank you, Richard. So we'll just move on to, um, we've got some more resources here. So when you get the copy of the recording of the webinar, um, because obviously we're going to be moving through, we've got all the links there where you can go and read for yourself a bit more information about what we've been talking about um, and also someone was asking, you know, they don't know what a survivorship care plan is. So if you read through some of these documents, you, you will get an idea um, and I think Karen's going to put up a little message about where you can get a copy of a survivorship care plan. Is that correct, Karen? Yeah. yeah. Um, so there's some areas of a bit more information for you. Um, and again, the Cancer Council Information Support 13 11 20. Um, please feel free to call that nationwide. Um, and again, Lifeline, if you have any issues that you want to talk to someone about tonight, 13 11 14. Um, when we finish, we have an exit survey. We'd really appreciate if you are able to complete the exit survey. It helps us plan for our future webinars. Um, and as I said, we'll be emailing you a link to the recorded webinar and um, probably sometime next week once we've 
made sure that it's all audible and you can see us all. So there, Karen's just put up on the chat box the website for the care plan. Um, now, so in the recording, this actually won't show. So I'll say it's www.survivorshipguidelines. Is that meant to be guidelines? Guidelines. Yeah. So G U I D E. Yeah. L I N E S dot org. So I'll say it again: www.survivorshipguidelines.org. So you can go there and get the care plan and I guess fill it out and go and talk to your doctor if there's things you need to find out about particular treatments or what have you. And it's a good document I guess to have you, if you're going to hospital and you, you know, as someone was saying earlier, they've got to repeat everything, you can just hand that over I guess. So thank you very much to all the panel, Karen, Michelle and Richard and Kate. Um, it was a, a pleasure to have all you on sharing your wonderful information and Michelle sharing your story. Thank you very much. And we'll say good night um, and thank you for everyone participating.